possible all the way up until the point where they happen. And then you look back on them and they look like they're always inevitable. <laughs> and I think we can look at the, you know, the movement to abolish the police, or the movement to abolish chattel slavery, the original abolition, the abolition movement in the 1800s, uh, where slavery was the foundation, the pillar of the United States capitalist economy, right? And not just the United States, but the whole global economy, because cotton that was grown by enslaved people uh, in, the, in the south of the United States was exported not just to the north of this country, but exported to Europe. And it was really the basis of capitalism being able to develop quickly was access to cheap cotton and other cheap resources from colonialism, right? Uh, and so you see this, this massive system that I'm sure a lot of people looked at and saw, oh, it's, it's, it's so powerful, it's so wealthy, it has these enforcers, the overseers, the slave catchers, it seems invincible, right? But then we can look back at it today and know that the fall of slavery was always inevitable because any system that's built on the exploitation and subjugation of so many people is like a house of cards that is, is ultimately gonna fall when the winds of rebellion pick up enough steam. And I think uh, that's just a really important lesson for us to situate ourselves in today, right? Uh, because again, now in our movement, uh, the demand to abolish it is picking up steam again. And we should try to learn lessons from the old abolition movement because I think although a lot of things have changed since the 1800s, the 150 years since you know the Civil War happened, uh, there's a lot of stuff underlying the systems that, that maintain the same, right? And I think at the heart of abolition is this rejection of the, the state's ability to deputize its agents, to brutalize and murder uh, and just exploit uh, black people and, and now today brown and all working class people so that you know the rich and powerful in society the capitalists can just more easily control and exploit us right that's the function of the police uh, and I think all of us who are here today or most of us here who are today know from our experience that the police in the society can't be reformed right we know this because we've seen them in our neighborhoods right we've seen them terrorizing and brutalizing and surveilling our communities and I think a lot of us have seen them terrorizing and brutalizing and locking us up ourselves right whether it's in our day-to-day -day lives or when we're at these protests and, and the police break out their tear gas and their pepper spray and the billy clubs and they beat on us and wreak havoc so we know that the, the police aren't here to protect us right we see that the function and, and it mentions this in the article that every time there's a movement for justice whether it's against police brutality or against evictions or against you know exploitation on the job we always run up against the police right it's the people on one side and the capitalist police on the other side and so there's no there's no reforming that their job isn't to protect us the job is to protect the status quo right the job is to protect the people who make money off of our backs and so that the demand to abolish the police in this country is correct uh, it, it is a correct demand and it's necessary to move us forward into a new stage of you know, development, a new stage of history in this country. But the question then becomes, not just is it right to demand to, to abolish the police, but what do we mean when we say to abolish the police and how do we plan on getting there, right? Because if we don't have clear understandings of those answers to those questions, then it's very easy for us to be led in one direction or another, have wool pull over our eyes, for us to just, to just be misled, right? So again, I, I find it personally really helpful to look back again at the abolition movement against slavery, the original, the original abolition movement in the 1800s, right? Where abolitionists, or at least you know, the, the more radical abolitionists, understood that it wasn't just about overthrowing the agents of slavery, right? It wasn't just about overthrowing the uh, overseers, it wasn't just over, about over, overthrowing the slave catchers or even just like the individual slave owners, but they understood that the entire social and economic fabric of the slave system had to be uprooted and replaced with something new. Because if you, if you keep the power and the land in the hands of the slave owners, then that just means even if slavery is abolished, that slavery will return, but by another name, right? And so the, the radical abolitionists, they understood that in the 1800s. And they also understood that the struggle for abolition was about power, right? It's a struggle for power between the oppressors and the oppressed. And a great example that happened during the Civil War, where uh, that was the, the peak of the struggle to abolish uh, of slavery, right? And during the Civil War, hundreds of thousands of enslaved black people 
fled from the plantations, right? They dropped their tools, they refused to work, and they fled the South, which completely destroyed the Southern economy, which we all know was based on slavery, right? Hundreds of thousands of people refused to work. And at the same time, 200,000 pe black people, many of them who would just leave the plantation in the South, joined the Northern Army, and they took up arms against the South to crush the slave owners, right? So we can't let anybody tell us that it was Abe Lincoln who freed the slaves, right? It was, it was enslaved people and other black people and other working class people in the Union Army who united to crush the power of the slave owners. And then the, the struggle for power didn't stop there, though, after the Civil War. There was Reconstruction. I think a lot of us probably heard that period of Reconstruction for 12 years after the Civil War, where uh, schools and hospitals and other public services were, were set up for the newly freed black families. And, and black elected officials were even put into power. And this was only possible because the black people in the South, and again, the Union Army, who were also there, were armed, right? And organized and empowered to repress the former slave owners and repress anybody who would try to put the slave system back in power. And that was what gave us a glimpse of what's possible in this country when working class and oppressed people actually have power. That was Reconstruction. But unfortunately, right, there were, there were moder uh, uh, moderate sections, the reformist sections of the abolitionist movement, and they collaborated with the northern capitalists and with the southern plantation owners to crush, abolition, or to crush uh, Reconstruction, right? Where they made it so that they ensured that the land was never seized from the former slave owners, from the plantation owners, and put back in the hands of the people who worked the land, put in the hands of the black people in the south, right? That was what was supposed to be 40 acres and a mule, but never happened because of the collaboration between the more moderate uh, reformist, abolitionists, and the capitalists, right? And then the, the Northern Army, the Union Army, left the South in 1877 after 12 years of Reconstruction, and that put forward the path for the rise of Jim Crow, the rise of the KKK, and the reign of terror against black people in the South, right? Because there, there wasn't a structure, an armed structure, to defend the gains of Reconstruction. And I think that it was important for us to really understand those political parallels, what that means today, because even today, right, we see the Democrats and the Republicans who have claimed to be enemies, but every time there's an uprising, they unite to repress our protests, to put us in jail, to lock us up. They're unified because they know that if, if they don't crush our uprisings, it doesn't matter the, the arguments between the Democrats and the Republicans because they won't be in power anymore out anyway, right? And that's the same thing that the Northern capitalists and the Southern capitalists, the plantation owners, they collaborated to save that system of capitalism, even though they had just been each other's throats, you know, a year before in the Civil War. Uh, so we need to be very clear on this because it helps us understand who our enemies are, who our allies are, who our comrades are, who our friends are, and there are lessons from uh, the, the, the history there. And so what, what, that, what I really look at this as is uh, the, the Civil War and Reconstruction were a revolution, but they were an unfinished revolution, right? So I see our job today is to finish that revolution, right? right. That the, the same capitalists, northern and southern, who collaborated with the, the plantation owners to make sure they could hold on to their land, they're the, they're the descendants today who exploit us, right? Who make money off our backs. So we get richer year after year after year, while we get paid shit wages, while we get forced to work during coronavirus and hundreds and thousands of us die, while we get evicted during this pandemic, all the while will they get richer, right? And so we need to we need to take that power, right? We are the source of their wealth and we should own that wealth. We make the world run, so we should run the world. And that's really what we mean by a revolution in the PSL, right? It's about seizing the wealth of society that we create and using it to benefit our communities. It's about smashing the institutions that the state uses to repress and control us, the police the army, the courts, and to create our own institutions, our working class institutions, that defend us and defend our interests, right? And it's about putting political power in the hands of working class and oppressed people. That's really what a revolution is. But it's not gonna happen spontaneously, and it's not gonna happen uh, just only by a small group of activists, right, bravely confronting the state, bravely confronting the police. That's not how revolutions happen, because we're up against the most well-organized, the most powerful, the richest state in the history of humanity, right? And so we need to be equally well-organized. We need to be disciplined, we need to be dedicated, and we need to have a mass movement to put pressure on the government, to put pressure on the state, 
but also we need to have a revolutionary organization to lead that movement, right? So that we're not misled, like the abolitionist movement in the 1800s ended up being misled by the moderate, the moderate abolitionists, right? We need revolutionary leadership to finish that revolution. And that's the type of organization that the Party for Socialism and Liberation is building here in Rhode Island and all across the country. So, you know, when you join the PSL, you get a training in the streets and in the books on how to be a professional revolutionary, how, how to be someone to carry up that legacy of confronting the capitalist state and building something new. When you join the PSL, you join uh, an organization that has a presence in over 90 cities, right? And that every single time there's a crisis in capitalism, whether we're uh, protesting against uh, police brutality, whether we're protesting against the new war that the U.S. government is starting, that you're gonna see PSL members in the streets all across the country providing a revolutionary analysis and struggling shoulder to shoulder with people because that's how we raise consciousness and that's how we build a movement to really upend this capitalist system. Because we know that every few years there's a crisis in capitalism, right? Whether it's due to climate change, economic crash, police terror, there's a crisis every few years that draws millions of people into the streets, millions of people. And the legitimacy of this system is challenged during those crises. And so the question isn't if there's going to be openings for us to have these rebellions, to have a revolution. The question is if we're going to be prepared, right? Are we going to be organized enough? Are we going to be experienced enough? Are we going to have connections in the movement to really move people towards a revolutionary solution? And that's where a party like the PSO comes in. So I've been a part of this movement for two and a half years, and I really am I'm glad to see all of you out here, and I invite you to join us in the PSO. Join us in doing our part here in Rhode Island to build that national movement, not just to smash capitalism and to abolish the capitalist police, but to build a new system, a socialist system, that's built on empowering and meeting the needs of working class and oppressed people here in the United States and across the world. So thank y'all for coming out, and I hope we can keep building together. Hell yeah.